Vocab, how you doing, brother? I am doing all right. Can you guys hear me good? Yes. So first off, before uh, let's let's give folks uh, a little bit about you and where can we get your book? Um, it's on Amazon and it's also on a website called thebookpatch.com. Those are the two places. Give you know, he's going to reach for it. Give the title of the book. <laughs> but there's there's the book. It's got a nice glossy cover, and it's called Barack Obama versus Black Hebrews and Life because there's a movie scene. Uh, that was like Obama's biopic, and there's a brief scene where he argues with some Hebrew Israelites in this in his biograph biographical pic that was on Netflix. And so I said, that's a good title for the book. I have not seen that video. I'll have to it's, go just, it's just it's not it, you know it's an actor, so I don't know if it happened, but he did walk through Harlem when he was at Columbia. So it's hypothetical that it could happen, which that means Obama is the earliest apologist against Hebrew Israelites. <laughs> Well, I don't know about that because I think the I, I know that I've been arguing with him for longer than he's been president, but I don't know. I'm just kidding. Um, hey, we just got a super chat uh, from Soldier for Jesus Christ 999, and it says, God bless you, brothers, in Jesus Christ. So a lot of people want to give that extra 99 cents or just wanting to save a penny. <laughs> so so you've done some vocab, I think, more research on the fake Hebrew Israelites than anybody I know. Uh, what got you studying this particular group out well so um they they first appeared on my radar when they started showing up in my uh kind of in my neighborhood in my old city which is columbus ohio and um they started busting into churches in the middle of services there uh and my friend who was in the neighborhood i had moved to phoenix already he told me about them and he said um do you know who these guys are and i did not know them at the time but I looked them up and found out, and I said, whoa, this is – because this is about a decade ago. I said, this is some religion, you know, but I never saw them or ran into them until one day in Phoenix I did see them. So I said, let me go talk to them because I actually know a little bit about them, and it was just a wild conversation. I recorded the audio, and I said, maybe people will be interested in this even though I don't think anyone knows who, they, who these guys are. So I uploaded it, and everybody wanted more. They wanted answers. You know, and so I was like, well, let me give you some resources. So I'd go around and look for resources, and I realized there's not really very many resources on these guys. What do I do? So I said, well, I'll just do it until someone else steps in. And then I kind of just ended up getting stuck there. <laughs> well, were they, when you say they're busting into churches, were they busting into African American churches or white churches or either? Predominantly historically black churches. They would come in, tell everyone they're Israelites and they need to keep the law. And if the congregation didn't accept it, which they never did, because you can imagine, they would curse them out in their fake Hebrew language, and then they would leave right before the cops came. Okay, now you, you brought up the fake Hebrew language. Um, so let's talk about that, because they do. I remember uh, one of the first times I had someone on the street try to tell me I don't know Hebrew. They did it because they, they gave this long paragraph or so in something that sounded sort of Hebrew, but not really. Right. And I, couldn't, I could not discern any, almost no words. Lashawan Kodash. Yeah. That's what it's called. It's called Lashawan Kodash. Most Hebrew speakers cannot make out what they're trying to say. Most so where did them, this come from? Well, this is something I never usually do, but I'm since I'm writing about this, I'm going to see if this makes sense if I read something that I'm working on writing. Um, and I think it will explain it. The main difference between Lashawan Kodash and modern Israeli Hebrew is that the former does not possess the vowels O, E, or U, nor does it have consonants that produce the sounds for V. The one vowel that Lashawan Kodash has that is not present in modern Israeli Hebrew is an I, as in pi or kite, which is only produced in the I-N, the 16th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Proponents of the Lashawan Kodash dialect assert that this letter can only be pronounced as an I. In other words, they believe, and then I've got a, I, or I got a little chart here I'm working on that kind of breaks down the way they pronounce each each letter. And I'll just read it to you here because you'll you'll see this is this is their alphabet pronunciation what I'm reading here. Ka ya ta cha za wa ha da ga ba a ta sha ra ka ta za pa. I sa na ma la. That's their alphabet. No. Their dialect comes from the fact that Lashon Kadesh means holy tongue. But since one Westers, this is the certain type of Hebrews who uses this, they pronounce it Lashawan Kadash. Similarly, they pronounce the popular greeting Shalom as Shalawam or Shalam, 
with regard to their salutation, one of the groups who broke away was called the House of David. They went underwent some evolution, and they used to do Shalom back in the mid-90s, but then they realized there was a Vav in there. So they switched to Shalom and later to Shalom. That's hard to say, Shalom. Over time, then they basically admitted this group particularly, this is one of the split-off camps, that they didn't know Hebrew. And so now they just say Shalom. So a lot of times when one of these groups will break off from the One West variety, their language will undergo some kind of change as well. Like GOCC, they're the only ones who call Jesus Yeshaya, whereas everyone else calls him Yahweh Shai. But yet they're still a One West Hebrews like group. It's a common thing they do. Since none of them know Hebrew, they'll make these weird uh, changes sometimes when they break out. And some of them just become pragmatic. IUIC, even though they hold a Lashawan Kodash, they say, well, nobody knows it, so we'll just call them Christ like everybody else. And their name is actually Israel United in Christ. They don't even use the Lashawan Kodash, even though they still hold that it's valid. So it's it's a, it's a big uh, mixed-up thing. But there's a lot of Hebrew Israelites who aren't involved with this, and they either want to learn real Hebrew or some of them actually learn real Hebrew. But those are not the guys you encounter on the street. Yeah, now, th- now this this form of or dialect of Hebrew – we see, I think the earliest we see it is for in Harlem in like, was it the 60s? Yeah, and there's some uh, debate about that because Abba Bivens is now understood to be the originator of it in some way. But up until recent times, everybody thought a guy named Arya was the originator. Arya had some kind of vision or dream. It's a little bit unclear. You have different versions of the story, and they're all oral, usually from former members, sometimes from current members. And it basically is. He, he, he saw a black man or a black angel speaking a language he didn't understand. And he said, what's that? And he said, that's the language of your forefathers. And then he had the Lashawan Kadash alphabet basically from that. But it's come to light really that Abba Bivens was bringing out this language, although it wasn't really in full force at the beginning dag- stages of the camp. And so that was slightly before. So it's unclear exactly when it fully developed because this group – the One West variety of Hebrews lights, these are the guys on the street. These are not all Hebrews lights, but they're the most militant and visible. Prior to that, they had broken off from a group called the Commandment Keepers, and the Commandment Keepers fancied themselves related to the Ethiopian Falashas, and they actually engage in trying to learn real Hebrew. And so this is sort of actually a devolution where now you have this Lashawan Kadash, and it's just one more way to say we're not affiliated with the Jewish stuff, basically, because then they call modern Israeli Hebrew, they call it Yiddish. Which we do have a Yiddish, and it's a mix of Hebrew and German. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I grew up hearing that in my household. But and and that's this is one of the things a lot of people may hear if they encounter uh, uh, these guys on the streets. And there's they'll hear people say, "Well, Hebrew went out of convention. People didn't speak biblical Hebrew, and they spoke a Yiddish, and therefore no one you know." The, the people who claim they're they're Jewish and claim that they speak Hebrew today really don't speak Hebrew because nobody knows what it sounded like. And, and they claim that, you know, they have the proper pronunciation and therefore everyone else is wrong. One of the things that I there's some truth to this, that the majority of Jewish people spoke would speak a Yiddish dialect and not a not Hebrew as they do in Israel today, speaking a Hebrew. And I, the thing that people have to understand, though, is in synagogues, the rabbis still spoke Hebrew. They would still read in Hebrew because that's what the Torah would be. And that's what the, you know, when they're reading from the scrolls, it was in the same Hebrew. So they've been doing that in the synagogues all along. And so they would have the pronunciations having passed down. So it doesn't have to be the common tongue of all Jewish people for it to be lost completely. I mean, it's kind of like people would say that, uh, I'm trying to think like with, with, uh, with Latin taking over with the Catholic church when people would speak Latin and therefore to, to, to then argue that we can't know what Greek sounds like because no one speaks that anymore. That actually would be a, a better argument than the Hebrews trying to make, but because not as many people spoke Greek, but Greek was still spoken. Uh, and so you can figure out how to pronounce it. I think when they try to make this case that the Hebrew language speaking it died out until they kind of revived it uh, is just not a good way of arguing because we have rabbis and synagogues for centuries who have been speaking it and therefore they would be able to keep the pronunciations. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Well, I mean, the history is, is good to explain and break down because, um, 
most of them sort of have a uh, a caric- caricature of uh, of Jewish history, especially in the modern era, and a lot of it is based on a revisionist history that's partially of their own devising, and um, they they generally just don't accept it. And so, you know, one time I brought some of this at, uh, up, and I said, you know, the first teachers at the old commandment keepers school and um, even Arya, there's an old picture of Arya. This is again, the guy who's credited a lot of times with bringing out Lashon Kadash. There's an old picture of him at a bar mitzvah. Now his father was bringing him there. Who was also involved with the commandment keepers, but that's significant. It so shows there's a rabbinical Judaism influence on the early days of even the modern Hebrew Israelites. So we brought out, you know, all these guys that you look up to, they learned whatever Hebrew they knew from mainly Ashkenazi Jews in the United States or from their grammars sometimes, but a lot of times from like exposure to rabbis and Jewish synagogues. And when we bring that information out and kind of explain why that's an argument partially against their position, because one, one group of people are retaining the language and the other one is not, they actually, um, one of their main defenders used this elaborate analogy and forgive me, I could get it partially wrong. I'll give the short version. It was something like this. Um, the folks who I think in Japan who had originated jujitsu, and if someone knows, please correct me if I'm wrong. They essentially over time uh, forgot how to use it in the finer points of it. And um, it was sort of a lost art with the place in which it originated, but it was still practiced in Brazil. And so then when um, the people... I think it was the Japanese, again, excuse me if I'm wrong, wanted to regain the knowledge of their own art form that they had originally invented. Apparently, a lot of them came to Brazil and studied under people like the Gracies, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, to understand their own lost art form. He actually used that as an analogy to say, so we had this language, we didn't retain it, but this other group of people who were ultimately uh, imposters, they retained it, and so we're picking it back up for them, but it doesn't necessarily mean... We are not the people, and they are. If that makes sense, that was an apologetic. For, uh, for yeah, they make, yeah. yeah. Well, let's, I, I want to clarify some terms because for people who don't deal with these guys on a regular basis may not know. And I, I want to do two things. You've mentioned a whole bunch of groups. I want to get to that because that's going to be a longer thing. But define for folks what an Ashkenazi Jew is, when, and they make that distinction. So, uh, you know, Andrew, correct me where I'm wrong, but here's, here's the way I would put some of these things. Um, there's a such thing you might call scholars that study this called modern Jewry, J-E-W-R-Y. And it means we've had uh, a spreading out diaspora, diaspora. And so because of that, um, people all the way back from the 70s, the 130s, all the way back, you know, the first and second century have spread out all over the world and went different places. The short version is those who kind of went through Europe and stayed there for a really long time, those are Ashkenazi Jews. So they have a similar phenotype. That means a display of their genetics, the way they kind of so-called racial characteristics that look similar to Europeans. But in, a lot of times in the West, that's where we, we're accustomed to seeing. Nose. We have a big nose and the dark curly hair. And you, you know why we have a big nose, by the way, right? I mean, I'm Italian, so I can't really say nothing, bro. I mean, well, I mean, you know, we, have, we have a big note because air is free. Okay. okay well, I don't know the reason why we have them, but, uh, you know, uh, Mario and Luigi have big noses for a reason in their caricatures. But the thing is, we're, we're kind of limited a lot of times, I think, in a perspective of what, what modern day Jewry is, because we see primarily, especially in pop culture, the Jerry Seinfelds, the Larry Davids, the Larry Kings, people of Ashkenazi Jewish descent. But there's a few things to remember about that. As far as the ethnic, the, features it's a mistake to say first century jews look like identical to ashkenazi jews and it's also a mistake to think that ashkenazi jews are the only kinds of jews because they're sephardic jews that's mainly spaniard descent and some of their traditions and other things are different it's not an identical there's yemeni jews there were iraqi jews they're almost all gone and if you look at iraqi and yemeni jews they don't look the same however when we do a lot of genetics we see matches between these different groups. And there is at least one group in South Africa slash Zimbabwe who matches up, especially in the male priestly clan of this group, 
in Africa called the Limba, and everyone was surprised when they showed that these folks had up to 50% Levant DNA on the on the men's side. It was sort of a shock, but and they have traditions that kind of match, but ironically, a lot of them are Christian, the, 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 the Limba people. But they look different than Ashkenazi Jews and somewhat to the Sephardic and definitely to the Yemeni and definitely to the Iraqi. And then you got Moroccan Jews, so folks in North Africa. You know, the closer you are to the Levant, generally speaking, even though there's been some Arabization, it appears, the more likely it is you look as if that's the main thing, but look probably to a first century Jew from what we can tell. And the reason why we say that is because there's something called bioforensics. They go and they take first century adult male Galilean skulls and they can get a general idea and they look pretty close to Iraqi Jews. And again, they're almost gone now. There's Iraqi Jews is now sort of a thing of the recent past. They're almost left. But it's, the reason why I had to look at this stuff is not because I had a deep desire to, to, to know some of those things. It's because I had to deal with Hebrew Israelites. And so it's countering their truth claims. Now, ultimately, it's the gospel. What is the gospel? Who is God? But along the way, you know, you uh, defend, defend, move on because uh, their obsession with who are the people of the book, it doesn't become your obsession, but uh, you need to have some facility to answer it. If you're sort of specializing in this, I'm not saying everyone needs to do that. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm just saying for me, it has to become something that I'm, uh, you know, learning constantly about. And so um, I hope that was helpful to what you're asking. Yeah, Brother Andrew. Well, I want to I want to because you just mentioned it's about the gospel. So let's get into, because someone had asked in the chat, what it is they believe. And this is going to be hard because for folks who are, who are listening, the, the thing you have to understand, and I think Vocab is going to could do this, if you haven't figured already, he's mentioned several different groups. The, the thing that I think makes this so hard to research these guys is they're not a single, you know, group think type of, and there's some things that they almost all have in common, but very little. They, they're like all over the board when it comes to their theology and what they believe. And it's going to depend on which group you're talking to. But could you go over at least some of the basics of what they would believe that would be different than what we might believe? And now, some will say they're they're Israelites. Some will say they're Israelites that are Christian. They'll, they'll claim Christ, but not all will. Yeah, so, that's a minority position. We'll say we're Christian. Sometimes they'll say that's minority position. They'll say... Uh, we're the original Christians or something like that. But yeah. Most, and, and yeah, yeah, most don't some accept the deity of Christ. Some don't. Right. So could you go just give like an overview of at least some of the, the main things maybe that they would all pretty much agree with and then where we would see some differences and, and then where would we differ from them? When they're new Testament acceptors, if they accept the new Testament, most of those guys are close to a King James only position or heavily favor it. That's a common thing. Um, uh, almost all of them that I've ever met, um, because it's a big deal to them, reject any other modern day claimants to being ethnic Jews. You know, so whether they're Sephardic or Moroccan or Yemen, yeah, I mean, they reject all, everybody. Um, most of them have some form of ethno eth ethnic hierarchy built into their system. So some it's very crass and base, and it's like this. ISUPK, for example, will say. You're going to go into hardcore slavery, Esau, and the other nations will be there with you. You know, the Arabs and the Asians and the Africans will be there with you, and you're going to be in hardcore slavery, and that's going to be your lot for the rest of eternity, something like that. Others say, no, 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 you guys are going to be brothers with us in the kingdom, but we'll have a relationship that's sort of like husband to wife. They've been given different offices of position and leadership, and Judah out of Israel always must lead, and that's why Gentiles cling to the garments citing an Old Testament passage, of Israel for entrance into the household of faith. So they basically, when they have that view, they replace Christ as the mediator, and they put Israelites in, in the place instead. But they'll say, you can be our grafted in spiritual Israelite brother. But a lot of times they don't let you teach. And it, people always focus, and I understand, you know, they'll say white people. Well, uh, most of these groups, though, they have a whole othering system. Othering, you know, where you kind of do a xenophobic maneuver to put someone over there. Well, as I mentioned, Asians, Indians, like East Indians, you know, Pakistan, you know, that, the, they're all Arabs as well, uh, you know, people of European descent and some other groups too. So it's not just, you know, white folks or whatever. It's, it's whoever they other. But uh, the ethnic hierarchy is a standard feature of there's a softer version and a harder version, but it's a standard feature of all the groups. 
a rejection of the Trinity. I know of one exception, and they're the group that looks closest to Christianity, and they're not um, influencing, you know, the guys out on the street necessarily. When it comes to the deity of Christ, a lot of times they haven't thought carefully through it, mainly because it's not a very important issue to them. And some of them will say yes, but you, you got to understand there a lot. Some of them are henotheistic, meaning they actually have other gods in their system in a way, kind of like a Jehovah's Witnesses schema. And it's a little unclear sometimes what they understand by divinity in terms like that when you ask them about that. And so that's it. That's an issue. Um, in, in salvation by work, some of the groups are crass where, yeah, you're earning your salvation. Others are a little more sophisticated where essentially it's more uh, like alchemy. You know, they're like, no, no, we're saved by grace. But then you must do the works of the law or you don't retain that grace, you know, or some weird uh, hybrid version. So as they spread out, some of these groups are getting mildly more sophisticated. And so you got to kind of ask them what they mean and see what's going on. And sometimes they do this. I'll give you an di example dialogue. And this is the last thing I'll do because I mentioned several things that are kind of held in common. Uh, the Christian might say to the Hebrews, like, are you saying that the Bible doesn't say that we're justified by faith apart from the works of the law? And the Hebrews like, might say, what do you mean? Well, you've just got to have both. We just read that. And then the Christian will point to Romans 3.28 and say, well, it says right here, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law or works of the law. And the Hebrews like, might say, yeah, that's the works of the sacrificial law. You guys don't understand that works of the law is talking about the sacrificial law. And Christ is our Passover, so we celebrate Passover, but we don't have to sacrifice the lamb or things like that. So they, they, they have these, this strange thing. They'll say, oh, the law is done away with. And a lot of times when they read it, they'll actually supply the word of sacrifice. They'll say, so, you know, the law is obsolete. The law of sacrifice is obsolete. You know what I'm saying? They'll, they'll do something like that. And they're basically saying you don't have to kill animals anymore. So well, the interpretation of scripture is a big problem that they have uh, throughout. You know, you mentioned the othering they do. I, one of the, I, I, one of the things I think when it comes to logic, I find so interesting. They will try to argue. You mentioned line of Judah being important. They will have groups. They'll say the Africans that were in the slave trade and came to America are from the line of Judah. Um, those that are in Jamaica, uh, I forget who, where they're, they, they basically argue that the tribes were taken by the slave traders and, and dropped off at different locations by their tribes. I find that to be one of the funnier things that they try to argue, and not all of them argue that, but those that do, I find it so interesting because when they do, it's like, wait, you're, are you telling me someone who is kidnapping somebody from another country and his, his major concern is to keep the, the tribe together as they ship them across the ocean to sell them as a slave like that. They're going to make sure that they keep all the tribes of the same together. It's, it's like just logically that's not going to work. Most of the training that I've seen that they get is on YouTube. I mean, there, there's tons of stuff on YouTube. And yes, when it comes to someone, when someone like me, who I will say, I am an Israelite, I am Jewish, they really have a problem with it. And they get very irate. And yeah, it, the language can be very, very racial. Uh, someone was commenting in the chat stuff that, and I've heard this myself, that uh, some of them would say that we're, you know, eventually we, the, the white people, uh, are going to be the slaves of, of these folks. Um, to put it the way the one guy, uh, you know, it's so, so interesting. I called out one guy for his language because he was claiming he's an Israelite and yet he's using foul language. I called him out on it and the, the leader, they have like a, a hierarchy and the, 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 the one leader was telling him to watch his language. But we got the video of their video. They put it up online and when we walked away, they were screaming. Like one, The one guy was going, I can't wait for the, the race wars to start popping so we can get these crackers being our slaves and raping their women. Not only racist, I mean, hyper racist, but their view is is really a revenge for something that none of them actually suffered. I mean, none of them were actually slaves in America. This is where more of the doctrine comes in. You said something that none of them suffered. Uh, they believe in reincarnation, so they did suffer it. Oh, really? Yeah. The, heard, 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 yeah. yeah. They believe that Jesus is Adam, Solomon, Isaac, and I forget who else, for example. Uh, some of them even believe that. Well, hold on, hold on. So they, they believe that he's Solomon and not David? Because um, that appears, would be interesting. It appears so. It appears so. Wow. And they used to teach one of their uh, one of their teachers, who's now dead, a guy named Masha, 
they taught that he was King David reincarnated. And so when he broke away and started his own school, he called it the House of David. But um, that's important to consider. And then I found this quote that was relevant. You mentioned about the transatlantic slave trade. It's a very short quote, but it's very interesting. This is General Yohanna speaking. He's a leader of the ISUPK, which is the Israelite School of Universal Practical Knowledge. Listen to this quote. Quote, slave traders sailed for months and days to get to specific points. They knew what people they were taking, specifically the lost tribes of Israel, end quote. So they actually think like Esau, you know, whoever the slave traders were, essentially is, you know, working in this wicked way where they, they know who they're getting. <laughs> yeah, which is which is I mean, I just don't picture guys that are involved in slave trades caring about that. But, you know, you mentioned about uh, there's no place where it says Israelites will own slaves. There are passages they use for this. And, uh, you know, if you haven't heard these, it can be tricky. So Isaiah 14 is probably the most common one for the Lord will have compassion on Jacob and will again choose Israel and will set them in their own land. And so sojourners will join them and will attach themselves to the house of Jacob and the peoples will take them and bring them to their place. And the house of Israel will possess them in the Lord's land as male and female slaves. They will take captive those who were their captors and rule over those who oppressed them. So that's a, a key proof text there. They say, what do you mean? We are going to have slaves. So they'll, they'll point to the ones and there's some other ones like that that they'll point to, such as Revelation 13, 9, 10. This one's especially egregious. The Isaiah 1, uh, 14 one could be a little more challenging. The Revelation 13 one, though, actually, it's not going to translate it as well as far as for their purposes in the ESV, because the ESV is more accurate here to, to the, 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 the grammar. But you still get the idea. Revelation 13 10 says, if anyone is to be taken captive to captivity, he goes. If anyone is to be slain with a sword, with a sword, must he be slain? And uh, the KJV rendering of it makes it sound like you hypothetically could uh, look at it as, oh, if anyone enslaved, they'll now be enslaved. And if anyone captured, they'll now be captured. But uh, that is talking about uh, on a lot of interpretations, depending on your interpretation of eschatology. But that, well, even if you want to make it more general, you don't even have to get into the eschatology. Basically saying during times of persecution, whoever God has d deemed and predestined and foreordained to experience certain levels of trials and tribulations and persecution – that's what they'll experience. That's that's what the passage is actually about. It's saying God knows who will experience what, and it's God's will who will suffer in what way. It doesn't have anything to do with if you captured somebody, now you'll get captured. It, so this was interesting. Ask them, is slavery wrong? Mm -hmm. And if it's one of the guys who believes in hardcore slavery for the other nations, they can actually say objectively, morally, that you know chattel slavery or brutal they can't say it's wrong. It really just depends who's doing it to who. Here's the thing with this. <laughs> This needs to be interpreted in light of Romans. That's the, right. that's and that's what they don't like to do, because when I go there and I show them, they'll say, "So wait, you're trying to tell me the guys who were not as people and now are are Gentiles?" I say, "Well, what else are you going to do with Romans?" This and that's where they get into this weird thing where a lot of them take the word Gentile in any kind of scripture that indicates something positive towards Gentiles, and guess what they mm -hmm. do. They say that simply means a scattered Israelite in a Gentile state of mind. Lost Israelites is, is what they're saying it means. Whenever it's contextually helpful, though, <laughs> but they, they don't do it all the time. They'll say, and if you laugh at that, they'll say, well, don't you believe the context should determine the interpretation? Now, I'm giving you some of the more sophisticated guys' arguments because a lot of the mm -hmm. guys uh, don't do that. But I try to say here's the yeah. best because because here's – let me make some predictions. Hebrews lights are going to grow. And like every other religious movement, as they go on, they change. One of the things that causes these groups to change is substantial interaction with Christian critics. Mm -hmm. When that happens, some of the groups will develop more sophisticated arguments. And they'll do things like rip off Jehovah's Witness arguments, rip off uh, Islamic arguments that are helpful, rip off actually some perhaps um, in some Mormons. cases. Yeah, yeah uh, even maybe uh, the anti-missionary movements among you know uh, Jewish people, things like that. And every now and then develop some of their own, oh, tap into Hebrew roots movements for, uh, and, yeah. and then, and then take British or Anglo Israelite movements and then flip them around. So they've got a lot of resources actually th to get uh, a whole cadre of more sophisticated, bad argumentation. My point is that's going to happen.
because I'm, I'm seeing their changes in the past three years where some of them are becoming more sophisticated. So here's my point. It's true there's silliness that goes on, but watch out. People don't always join religions or whatever it is they're getting a part of strictly for intellectual reasons. There can be powerful, emotionally and morally felt needs that the religion satisfies. And the intellectual arguments almost become a afterthought. But it catches up to where those intellectual arguments aspect of it become more sophisticated over time. So my point is they're going to do this, and you'll see it, and we'll just have to kind of be ahead of them and constantly – shutting each one down like a game of whack-a-mole. But I just encourage people to watch out because you may think they're the eisegetical underdog, and they are, but these groups can creep up on you, and we just got to be prepared. That's that's sort of what I see in the future, and so the apologetic community should be uh, aware, at least those who are engaging with this. Mm -hmm.